skeptic or a cynic, and I am one or both of those right here, would say, okay, you beat a C-rated fighter. So what? Well, I, I mean, think... you're, you're trying to get wider public acceptance. You fight a guy nobody ever heard of. He's unknown, he's unranked, and you knock them out. Big deal. Gonzalez had an incredibly busy year from late 2013 to the end of 2014, fighting former unified champion Francisco Rodriguez Jr., Oscar Blanquet, a fight of the year nominee against WBC lineal champion Akira Yayagashi, and Rocky Fuentes to end the year off. Roman decided to have a homecoming bout to celebrate his accomplishment of becoming a champion in three different weight classes well deserved of an easy fight, but holy crap, they couldn't find a guy with a more attractive record. The Latin Leon's record is of something you'll see playing online on fight night. The man had 29 wins, 29 losses, and 3 draws. Well, you know, Lisi doesn't have a losing record. Roman dragged the guy out to get the fans their money's worth and finished him off in the 7th round. Well, at least with this one, he had a promotable record at 29-1, and one, but I honestly do not know what Hernandez did to earn the title shot. Berto's WBC mandatory opponent was Selic Aydin since 2009. Early in 2010, Berto was supposed to unify against Sugar Shane Mosley. The fight was cancelled due to Berto's native country attack by an earthquake in January. He went there immediately to give aid. Again, I don't know how this works out because Aydin is the mandatory. I assume he paid his team to step aside, forcing him to follow with it. And there you go with the Freddy Hernandez fight. Like I said, Hernandez fought like he didn't belong there, and Berto put him away in the first round. Berto fought Carlos Quintana earlier that year in April, but by WBC rules, he needs to make one mandatory defense annually or be stripped. Due to the whole selection of opponents with Berto fights, this is the first time HBO actually called out Al Heyman. Al Heyman's a manager and advisor, a power broker in boxing, in case you don't know who he is. And there's a backlash in boxing, I think, at times against Al Heyman fighters because he seems to wield uh, influence out of proportion with others in boxing. He's able to get one of his fighters an eight-round fight, practically unheard of, on HBO against an overmatched opponent, a fight usually that wouldn't be seen on HBO. And inform the viewers, which they usually never do, about behind-the-scenes boxing. Andre Berto, for years, has been criticized for not fighting top opposition for handpicking. Andre Berto's not handpicking anyone. He'll fight anyone. That's the people around Andre Berto being careful. And so there's been a backlash against Cayman fighters, which is deserved in one way, but in another way, kind of unfair to the fighters. Somehow, the WBA threw Duran into the rankings and a commission sanctioned this fight. Now you have a 1998 Roberto Duran at the age of 47 fighting the champion William Joppy. Duran had not a single moment in this fight and gets put away in the third round. I don't know why Joppy is celebrating. That win is just as valuable and meaningful as doing a movie with Marlon Brando in the 90s. While Lewis had no shame, and he would often title these fights himself as the bum of the month, Galento, in his own right, is a legend, a person of boxing history, but absolutely no way he was going to beat Joe Lewis. Just look at Joe's stoic reaction here. He's just like, yeah, whatever, I wonder what's for dinner tonight. It's almost like he didn't really want to be there. I think Zab just needed an opponent, and the network needed a slot in their card to fill in, and well, there you go. HBO briefly going over Wayne's resume, and that's literally all you need to know. Notable fights. Meldrick Taylor and Livingston Bramble. Those would have been great wins in about 1990 <laughs> or 1986. But in 2002, you just shake your head and say, oh my gosh, where did they find them? First round TKO for Zab Judah. Is the left fight these days? Are you ready for That's five? it right there. <laughs> that's it right there for sure. There's the fifth knockdown and that's the end of the fight. 
Pacquiao had just became the WBC flyweight champion. It looks to be a stay busy homecoming slash non-title tune-up fight. Todd McKillum had seven wins, four losses. He won one of his last three fights. Pacquiao would drop him in the second round, then finish him off in the third. This fight was for the vacant WBA Intercontinental title. Even Klitschko was self-aware how much of a joke this matchup is. He said if he didn't beat Moly, he would threaten to retire from the sport. Klitschko beats Moly in 97 seconds. Moly was then booed by the entire stadium for his poor performance. This fight was memed right when it was announced. Zerifa was a part-time exotic dancer and a part-time boxer. He was ranked number 87 in the world. I think when a fight is such an incredible mismatch from the get-go, I believe the ref should step in and protect the fighter quicker than usual so they can fight another day. Mercanti stepped in a bit late and the unfortunate aftermath is you have a young 23 year old fighter being hauled off in a stretcher. Well, this is scary, you know, you never like to see a fighter. Michael Zarafa stretchered out of the ring. Peter Quillen wins by knockouts. Frightening moment here for Zarafa. This was on the Mayweather Pacquiao undercard, and my gosh, this very well could be the worst undercard ever assembled for a prize fight. This was during all the hype of Regan Dial versus Santa Cruz. You would think that would have been made since there's a large enough budget to give both guys a payday or at least a WBC mandatory or someone with the ranks worth noting. Nope, 10 round non-title bout against a boxer who is ranked 167 in the world. Gotta give Jose credit though, because he went all 10 rounds. This is a situation here, it would have never flown by with the IBF. Unranked by the WBC and WBA, and yet he's fighting for Danny Garcia's junior welterweight title. Now, Teddy, there are criteria and qualifications you have to meet to fight in a title fight. One of them is that you have to be either a top 10 rated contender, a former champion, or a current champion, among other things. He doesn't meet any of those criteria. So how is he getting this fight? Can anyone say Al Heyman? Holy crap. And if it wasn't for the media backlash, they almost got away with it. Danny Garcia was facing number 40 ranked lightweight. Also, he fights at Super Feather too, Rod Salka. And somehow this magically got approved by the WBC and WBA. He's not rated. I wanted to show you that 15 guys in each one of those organizations are rated. He's not one of them. He's not even close. What is the sense of having ratings when you don't live up to your own rules? Garcia was supposed to face mandatory Victor Postal and somehow got out of that. Like I said, they almost got away with this till a wave of bad press came and both organizations took a step back and made it a 10 round non-title bout. Any other sport, there being an attorney general would be showing up somewhere. We have to investigate this. Wait a minute. You can't just move a guy from nowhere to all of a sudden where he's going to fight for a world title. Fortunately, in this sport, with no proper supervising, no proper watchdog, no proper policing, you can do those things. This isn't the case of a talented champion from a division below, like in the old days, like the welterweight champion challenging the middleweight champion, middleweight versus light heavyweight. No, that's not the case at all. Danny does the obvious and knocks out Salka. The commentators somehow called this a statement being made. That is not a statement. A statement being made, doing your job as champion, fighting your mandatory opponent, and knocking him out in the fashion you did to that number 40 ranked fighter from another weight class. Now that's a statement. Aren't you embarrassed by this? A great fighter having to fight a mandatory that's by the rules. I have to fight because they would do like Roy Jones didn't want him to do before he fought John Oish. Oh, don't tell title. me, don't tell me about hey, John. If, if I didn't fight 
and defend my mandatory with the WBC, they would strip me. And I don't care what you say or anybody else say, this is my life, it's my prerogative, you do your job, I do mine. Before we get on to the next match, be sure to hit that like button and leave a comment. As stated in my previous video, YouTube is straight fooling when it comes to these things. They don't share my videos to all my subs if it doesn't reach a certain amount of comments and likes. Last week they gave me this notification which it looks like we're in a positive direction here. But unfortunately, some aren't seeing my uploads till days later. I greatly appreciate everyone's effort in my last upload. Y'all are amazing. To make things more interesting for you guys, let's try a comment section discussion topic. This week's topic is on what fighter or fight got you into boxing? Leave in the comment section. For me, I actually got into boxing through Fight Night Round 3. Yep, a video game. The first fight live on TV I would ever watch that got me hooked into the sport to always tune in was Ricky Hatton versus Luis Colazzo. Great fight, great watch if you haven't seen it yet. Thanks for viewing up to this point, and now back to the video. Roman was actually ranked at number 9 by both organizations. This was the first heavyweight title fight in Japan. The size disadvantage here was quite alarming. Dude looked like a cruiserweight in comparison to Big George. Now Foreman makes an actual statement here, completely obliterating him in the first round. On the wholesome note, Foreman donated $10,000 of his check to the Japanese Home for Disabled Children's Fund. This is a crystal clear reason why people have protested to bring back same day weigh-ins with fights and why there is a hydration limit in contracts because you get awful sights like this. Kamash, who is physically smaller anyway, came in on fight day at a 146 pounds. Gaddy weighed in at a whopping 160 pounds. Dude was a middleweight. Kamash put on a courageous effort, but that fight should have been waved off a lot sooner. Gaddy knocks out Kamash. According to HBO, this was the second time Gaddy had came in 15 to 20 pounds heavier than his opponent. This fight would send Gamash to the hospital for a week, resulting in public scrutiny against Gaddy. Gamash has not stepped in the ring since after the Gaddy fight. Arturo Gaddy gained an awful lot of weight, and as a result, there is a pending multi-million dollar lawsuit by the Gamash camp against the New York State Athletic Commission for what they feel was a poorly executed weigh-in. Due to the backlash, the New York Athletic Commission's response coming to Gaddy's next fight, they made all the undercard fighters who were fighting below heavyweight to weigh in the day of the fight rather than weighing in the day before the fight. It is just a problem with Gotti, it's a problem in boxing, but how do you fix the problem? As long as a fighter makes the weight designed by the contract, I don't believe there's a problem But the next day him weighing up to 40, 50 pounds over. So not only Stackhouse was medically suspended by the New York Athletic Commission after failing exams due to obvious deterioration, even if he passed, he was already guaranteed medical suspension anyway for having an, an eight fight losing streak. Stackhouse somehow passed all medical exams to, the, to fight Roy Jones Jr. in Florida. Besides not showing a single sign of warming up, dude was straight dry. From the opening bell, there was already blatant signs this man should not be in the ring. Jones puts him away within seconds. Sanisa Estrada, an incredibly talented fighter, she was up against Miranda Atkins, 5-0 with 5 knockouts. Just taking a minor dive into this, Atkins is a Midwestern fighter who was building up experience, I would say, fighting far lower skilled opponents who would serve as a sparring partner, but it's awarded a pro bout. This brings to one of my favorite tale videos I made, which was of the Midwest legend Buck Smith, aka the hardest working man in boxing. Now Buck would pick up boxing while attending a fight as a spectator. One of the fighters on the card was a no-show. The promoter got desperate and offered anyone in the crowd $100 to step in. Buck volunteered and even though he lost, which would be his pro debut, he was actively fighting after that. Now Buck was able to get in some experience fighting Atkins level opponents to lose a majority decision against the undefeated gold medalist Robert Wingila. Then to get his revenge with a second round TK 
Pacquiao victory over Robert, one year and some change, and 70 fights later. I'm not joking. Buck was 22 and 1 the first fight, and the rematch, he was 92 and 2. Just shows how much experience one can get literally fighting on the road without having an amateur boxing background. It keeps me busy, it keeps me learning, and uh, also it keeps me active. Um, I don't sit around the house, you know, for uh, several weeks or waiting for something to come up. And uh, I learn more in the ring than I do in the gym. But in this case, this would not be a success story for Atkins. She would get knocked out literally in the first couple of seconds of the fight, making it the fastest knockout in female boxing history. Obviously, this would spark massive outrage among fans, but these mismatches happen all the time. Sinise's words in regards to the fight in an interview by Airshow Sports, she really couldn't have said it best she knew her opponent didn't belong in there and she wanted to take her out as fast as possible in which she did it in a vicious manner then she brings up ryan garcia and how he's had similar opponents in the past that he has taken out without any outrage to compare and contrast fighters in these types of fights fighters would test out new tricks that they have been learning in the gym and drag things out as long as they possibly can before setting up the knockout shot almost like painting a fine picture sinise is like f all that takes all the buckets of paint and yeets it all over the blank canvas now if she just showed off her skills threw some flash showcased her amazing defense then took her out with a brilliant counter or a shot she was setting up there would have been no outrage at all now from what I just said, this is really easier said than done because look how Atkins came out the corner. That right there just made her job a lot harder if she was going to go that route. This is just a matchmaking nightmare here. Duran was making his 10th defense of his WBA title against Alvaro Rojas. In the promotion of the fight, they displayed Rojas's record 26 and 3. Rojas himself claimed he was 46 and 9, but record books have him at 4 and 4. A lot of he said he said here, but Duran blew through this man like what Vegeta did to freeze his foot soldiers. He stands out as an example of what is wrong with boxing. The WBC has ranked him the number one contender in the 140 pound class. Can anybody tell me why? In the past year, he's not fought a ranked fighter in any weight class. He hasn't fought at 140 pounds since March. 1998. I don't know if it's better for me to explain or the broadcasters because this is wild how this fight was forced on Zoo and Showtime. Since Showtime was forced to air this fight, they took the time to slam the WBC and my gosh, they really grilled them. This is a mismatch of the worst possible kind. Well, who's to blame? We all are. Starting with the WBC for mandating the fight and the local boxing commission for licensing it. The promoter who has no choice but to stage a fight or have his fighter stripped of his belt. But add him to the list and let's not forget us, the television network, for showing it. And the public for coming to see it. And last of all, the fighter himself, whose self-delusion cannot be faulted. After all, he is thinking with a damaged organ. Fans came out in full force and really tried to amp up the legend. Chavez did put up a spirited effort, but it was so clear that Zhu was keeping it easy during the first two rounds. Zhu really cranked it up and Chavez could have retired any time from the fight, but he chose to stay in. Zhu was able to stop Chavez in the sixth round. Unfortunately, some angry Chavez fans began hurling objects into the ring. And on top of that, this is boxing's biggest mismatches. For more videos like these, be sure to like, share, and if you're new, subscribe. Subscribe to the Patreon for early access and Patreon-backed projects. I'm Olfus Hancho, and I'm out.